This forum is, candidates forum, is on the school to prison pipeline. It's being sponsored by Racial Justice Now, which is an organization headed by myself and Ms. Maria Holt. Uh, my name is Vanilla Randall. I'm <coughs> Professor Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law. Uh, and it's also being, we also are part of the Dignity in Schools 2013 National Week of Action. In fact, we're the only parent paired group in Ohio that is a part of that action, and there's only two groups in Ohio that are doing anything. So I think that the, we appreciate all the support that Dignity in Schools have given us. To start off, what we would like to do is ask everyone to cut off their cell phones. And so I'm going to give you 30 seconds for you to reach in and make sure your cell phone is cut off. And I think i got to do that too. <laughs> um, we also are handing out contact forms. And we ask you to please con uh, complete the contact form and turn it in when you leave. Oh, excuse me. Uh, as Professor Randall said, I'm Maria Holt, um, co-founder for Dignity in Schools campaign, and I am a parent of a student in Dayton Public Schools. I'm also a community activist, and this issue is especially dear to my heart. I have a son, um, and he attends um, the all-boys school. So this is a passion of mine. I'd like to see um, our school district use some more restorative justice and uh, positive behavioral um, uh, discipline techniques instead of strictly punitive techniques um, when disciplining children. So I'm excited about the candidates being here, um, running for office to answer some of the questions that are of concern to us as an organization and also to the community. I want to just, uh, we'll let the candidates introduce themselves when we go through the first questions. Um, one of the things I want to do is identify the rules. Uh, we will ask the question, we'll give a little bit of information, ask the question, uh, we, we, we use, I re, the candidates for each question has been put in a random order and we will say who is supposed to speak first, second, third, uh, and uh, the candidate will have two minutes to talk. Uh, when we are in with uh, the last 30 seconds, my student Alan, Alan, you want to show the 30 second side? And to the candidates? Yes. And that's when you show it to the candidates. And the stop sign, when your two minutes over, Rodney will hold up the stop sign. Because we really want to stay on time, I'm, I'm giving forewarning people that if you don't stop, I'll just have to interrupt you. And so I'm not being rude, I'm just keeping it moving. Um, <laughs> Okay, so having said that, we have asked a general question. We have we've told the candidates that to the extent that they answer a question that's about their platform, they should relate it back to the school to prison pipeline. But essentially, this first question is intended to give them an opportunity to talk somewhat about themselves and also about the school to prison pipeline. So the first question is, the school to prison is a definition. The school to prison pipeline is one of the most important human rights challenges um, for our nation today. The school to prison pipeline refers to a national trend of criminalizing rather than educating our nation's children. And the first person that, um, well, Ronald is not here, so we'll ask Mr. Hickman to answer first, please. Um, what is your opinion about mass incarceration and how the school to prison pipeline contributes to it? Generally, what do you think needs to be done? Good evening. My name is Walter Hickman. I'm a newbie. My history in this town is that I'm a lifelong resident and I'm a retired <laughs> firefighter and a, a deputy sheriff. To answer the question, I think that uh, some of the issues in the school are more of a problem now than what they were before. 
the punishment for kids now is no, you know, it's no longer like throwing a rock or having a little fight out in the street or anything else like that. It's, it's the ante's been up. And I think it's going to be a very difficult unless we get parents involved, community involved. The uh, one issue we have with the school right now where someone played a prank and sent in a message about a bomb in the school. The ante is up on that, on that. And parents need, need and teachers need to inform these children of that ante and that because they got a computer and the things they can do with it, they have to understand there's a price to pay. The <clears throat> other thing on that is that I think that fights in school right now, as many cameras as the school got, they should have, they should monitor them. Because an individual who's trying to defend themselves should not get the same punishment as the person that, that's uh, starting a fight. Hazel Roundtree, I'm a candidate for the Davis School Board. I've been an educator for over 30 years, both as a classroom teacher, a school counselor, and currently I'm an administrator. I work directly for the president of Wright State University, and I work in the area of civility. One of the things that I focus on is how to ensure that we establish civility on our campus and we ensure positive campus relations. So I think that's an issue that will address the school to pipeline uh, issues. One of the things that I want to underscore is that it's not the, 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 the criminalization is not for just for serious crimes. It's just for any crimes. There's a zero tolerance policy that says if if they say you can't shout and you raise your voice, then you're going not to be uh, sent to a counselor's office as maybe a, people would do in the past, but you're going to be directly uh, intervened by the law enforcement. And that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. What we need for this situation are, are several steps. First, we have to create a culture of civility. We expect students to come into campus, or, or come into the classroom, come into the school building, and know about manners. It's this basic good manners. It starts with preschool. Please and thank you. We, we can't ignore that anymore. That's the first book I bought my granddaughter. Please and thank you. Spike Lee wrote a book called Please Baby Please. And that's the first book I bought my granddaughter. And that's what I tell students. When they come on our campus and they try to talk about our, my professors being racial. When you walked into the classroom, you were loud, you bumped everybody's books out the way. Show some respect. So I think if we teach children respect, then we're gonna reduce the amount of violence and we're gonna create a greater culture of civility. And I really believe that's what's needed. But training for teachers is the first step. Teachers are the most important people in the students' lives, and they're not trained in civility. They're not trained in helping the students to solve problems. My name is Joe Lacey, I'm currently on the Board of Education. I'm currently the Board of Education President, and um, I have a daughter at Ruskin Elementary School. She's, she's in kindergarten there. And um, for me, actually, I having a daughter who she's in kindergarten there, but she, this, she, this is her third year there. So that, so really, my experience with Ruskin has colored a lot of, of my experience with the schools. Ruskin and Belmont currently are the two schools in the system that, that use restorative justice. So um, I'm not I'm not only not only do I have a daughter at Ruskin, I have, I sit on the board for Ruskin, as well as the Dave Board of Education. So I see how restorative justice works, and I see the success that we get with restorative justice, and I want to, uh, I, I, I do want to expand that beyond the two schools that we have. To your question, um, the extent to which uh, the, school di the school discipline system contributes to um, to the, to the classroom to prison pipeline, um, I, I, tend, I tend to believe, yes it does, especially, um, I'm sure that there are some, that there are districts, 
especially in the South, that, that, um, that are particularly punitive. Um, I do think it needs to, we need to, before I can come to that conclusion about our own system, I think we could do some more study about our system. But, I mean, I'm not going to wait for study. I really do believe that the, that the restorative justice system works, and I would, I would my, my thinking is expanding that is, it makes more sense for our district anyway, and for our community. Thank you, candidates. Um, with only 5% of the world's population, the United States have 25% of the world's prison population. Nearly 50% of all state prisoners are locked up for nonviolent crimes. Blacks, particularly young black males, make up a disproportionate share of the U.S. prison population. And in 2008, young black men ages 18 to 34 were at least six times more likely to be incarcerated than young white men. Young black males without a high school diploma were more likely to be in prison or in jail and on any given day in 2008 than to be working. The pipeline encompasses the growing use of zero tolerance discipline, school-based arrest, disciplinary alternative schools, and secure detention to marginalize our most at-risk youth and deny them access to education. Zero tolerance disciplinary policies are often the first steps in a child's journey through the pipeline. And basically zero tolerance. In Ohio, we unfortunately have a law that uh, requires zero tolerance to some extent. Uh, generally, zero tolerance imposes severe discipline on students without regard to the individual circumstances. Senate Bill 167, which is going to go through the legislature, would uh, eliminate the state law requiring zero tolerance. Would you support that bill? Would you support a moratorium in Dayton, regardless of the bill, on suspensions? If, under what circumstances would you support that and, uh, and, and instead substitute a restorative justice, which is another form of discipline um, that Mr. Lacey talked a little bit about, and positive behavior change, which is another form, form of discipline, um, both of which are known to reduce suspensions. Uh, Mr. Lacey, you actually go first. Or I am I am familiar with uh, is it House Bill 176 Senate Bill Senate Bill 176 I believe 167 167 Senate Bill 167 It is but it it's sponsored by Charlita Tavares is my understanding and I and I have a great deal of respect for for Representative Tavares and or, or is she now state senator She's state senator She's state senator Tavares in Columbus and. And I, and, and I do support that bill. Um, as, but as far as, as, um, but as, as far as going as suspending all or, or stopping all suspensions, um, I'm not sure that I would go that far or to support that at this, at this point. I mean, I think we do, even though we do have a zero tolerance policy, I believe we have a system I mean, the, the zero tolerance policy is not that clearly defined, and I, I, I would have to be shown within our system, within the Dayton public school system, how zero tolerance it is in, in practice, because it, not being so clearly defined, I do believe we, even in schools that do not have restorative justice, I believe there is, more, there is a lot of intervention going on. Although, in many cases, I think there is extension involved, too. Um, I mean, there are political ramifications, too, for this. I mean, in 2001, when I ran for, when I first ran for school board, I ran against a group of four women who basically spent $250,000 on a, on a campaign that part of, that a big part of that campaign was more discipline, more discipline. You couldn't turn the TV on without saying our school, without seeing one of their commercials saying our schools need more discipline. More discipline sells, and, and, and that's part of the problem. Mrs. Brown, you're next. 
In addition to being a classroom teacher, I'm also trained as an attorney. I graduated with a law degree from the University of Dayton School of Law. And I happen to have consulted with Senator State Senator Tawara on this particular bill to stop the zero tolerance. So I'm a strong proponent of eliminating that particular form of punishment. As a law student, I worked with an attorney, James Green, on a case where a student was in the uh, school nurse's office and she took an aspirin without the nurse's permission because she had cramps. She was a very young girl, had menstrual cramps, very unfamiliar with the kind of pain associated with it, and she took an available uh, over-the-counter aspirin because she thought that would bring her some relief, and she was expelled from school because they had a zero tolerance policy of no drug use. And, and aspirin is a drug. And here's a student in excruciating pain she takes an aspirin from the school nurse's office. It was unattended, if you want to note that. You know, it was unattended uh, medicine available to anyone, and the student was expelled. That's what a zero tolerance policy, that's how a zero tolerance policy operates. There's no analysis into the situation. There's no reviewing the circumstances. It's just zero. You did it, boom, you're out. And I think that's the type of, of, of reasoning that we don't want in the schools. If we require educators to have college degrees, if we require principals to have master's degrees, then we should expect them to make some good decisions. And I'm saying that children who misbehave need to be addressed. I believe in more discipline, but I think teachers have to be trained to be disciplinarians, and that will avoid some of the conflicts that occur in the classroom. We have to teach teachers how to be managers, how to control, how to have presence in the classroom. You can have a straight A teacher with beautiful bulletin boards, but if they don't know how to command the attention of their students, they will be in trouble. Thank you. Mr. Hickman. I'm a little bit old school. You get do the crime, you do the time. But what I think they should do is that you got a lot of things that a lot of uh, things that are done in the school that are nonviolent. But do you want to tolerate drugs? Do you want to tolerate guns? If they haven't shot the gun, it's a nonviolent crime. This has, it has to be put in perspective. This is not a subject that's lightly just throw around and say, oh, we don't want our kids to get in trouble. But at some point in time, the community, the parents, are going to teach these kids. They're going to have to tell the kids that this is the way it has to be. These are the rules we have to follow. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Thank you. Thank you. One last comment on the zero tolerance policies. The research shows that there is no evidence that zero tolerance policies make schools safer or an improved student behavior. In fact, most of the research suggests that the overuse of suspensions and exclusion may actually increase the likelihood of later mis criminal conduct, largely because these kids are home from school unsupervised. Uh, because of parents who have to work. Schools today rely on law enforcement rather than teachers and administrators to handle minor school misconduct. What role should police officers play in the safety and security of schools? Should there be police officers in schools? Should school resource officers carry guns? Should they have authority to arrest even when there is detention without arrest is possible? Ms. Roundtree, you're the first to answer this question. I guess my, my first response is that training needs to happen. We need to educate. We need to educate teachers, principals, parents, and students on what <coughs> our expectations are. We have to establish a culture of civility. So police officers have a role in that, but they should be, their role should be that as a trainer. They should come to the schools and be a part of any curriculum that will help the teachers and administrators learn how to keep the law and order into the classroom. I think that it starts with the teacher empowering the teacher, not empowering 
just a police officer or a resource person. Do I think that there may be some circumstances where the halls might be safer with hall monitors? I do, because I believe in adult supervision. I don't, I don't, I think one of the worst travesties is kicking kids out of school, sending them to the streets, and then they're out on their own being raised by their peers, being raised by the streets. I would rather have them in the school, in an in-school suspension type program, and if the police officers could do community policing, where they're educating, where they're establishing relationships, where they're, where they're sharing their resources, you know, to help make the place a safer place, where they're practicing prevention. I think that's what's needed, and the police officers do have a role in that. Parents need to be trained on what the expectations of the school are. The church has a role, community members have a role, police officers have a role, but it's an education and prevention. perfectly clear, no guns in our schools, none. Other than the trained police officer that's there to do his job. Now, what I understand about the police officer coming in, I try to get a statistics on the Dayton school system, but it hasn't arrived to me yet, so I have to kind of skip around a little bit. But we got kids in here in this school that have behavioral problems, that the educator shouldn't have to be involved in. Even being trained, it's enough that, I feel it's enough that they got to teach 35 students or less in a classroom, let alone have to deal with one individual that's gonna take away from the rest of the class. So, the way I feel that I think that a police officer should be involved for the safety of everyone, uh, you don't know what kind of situation is going to come up. You don't know who they called before they were directly confronted. So I think it's safe for all that way. Thank you. My, my experience with Dayton Public Schools is that we do use in-school suspension. We do, actually, to a great degree, we use in-school suspension. And um, I, I guess I'm not familiar with the Aspen incident, so, but I, I'm not aware that they, if that happened at, at Dayton Public Schools, so maybe we'll know later. Um, the, um, also, and with, with regard to police officers, I don't believe that we have any regular police officers um, that are assigned to a Dayton Public School. Um, and, and that's that's probably more that the that, that Dayton Public Schools could not afford to pay the city to do, to have a regular assignment there. But um, I don't think, I, but I also agree with, um, with, with the sort of justice that, that it's, it, it's probably not useful to have a police officer there unless, um, unless the situation is out of hand. So, um, that's, yeah, that's all that I have. Uh, just as a follow-up, uh, there are actually police, uh, retired police officers yes. that are the head of Dayton Post mm -hmm. School of Safety and Security. They were just hired this year. So yes. We've met with both of them, a retired police officer from Dayton and a retired police officer from Trotwood. Mm -hmm. um, the school board, I guess, and the superintendent felt the need to hire two police officers um, at the Board of Education. Growing numbers of school districts employ full-time police officers or school resource officers to patrol middle and high school hallways with little or no training in working with youth. These officers approach youth as if they are adult perps on the street rather than children in school. The explosion of school-based arrests cannot be attributed to an increase in youth violence. Between 1992 and 2002, school violence actually dropped by about half. Despite the fear generated by a handful of highly publicized school shootings, schools remain the safest places for young people. Resources that could be put towards improving under-resourced schools are instead used for security and police. School districts spend millions of dollars for police officers and security officers. I just want to note that Dayton Public School employs police officers. 
You can call them school resource officers, but they are licensed under the state and trained under the state exactly. as police officers. Uh, we actually met, they have 37, 31 police officers. Now there's a hierarchy of police officers, so they're trying to like, we're at this level of police officers. But they're trained, they have, they have arrest powers, they have, uh, the, uh, they have been trained to use guns, and while Dayton doesn't authorize their police officers to use guns, uh, they have been trained to do so. So these are not s school resource people who are in a safety <laughs> position. These are police officers who work as school resource people. Um, the rise in suspension and expulsion in school-based risk may be due in part to the rise in high-stake testing. In Dayton, in 2012, and I don't think Dayton does in-school suspension, at least they're not calling it in-school suspension, and they're not, they're not reporting it to the state as in-school suspension. In 2012, Dayton had 5,406 out-of-school suspensions uh, for African Americans, 5,406, and 69 of those were for so-called disruptive or disobedient behavior, not for violence, not for drug use, or any of those things. So, in high-stakes testing, uh, domestic programs such as the no Child Left Behind Act have led to incentivizing school to push out low performing students in attempts to increase overall school tests. Do you support eliminating high stakes testing to the extent that we can? I know that it's dictated to some extent by federal government, but we can and what kind of emphasis should we be putting in our teaching on high stakes testing? And how can we implement programs at a local level to ensure that all students, regardless of high or low performance, receive the same opportunity to succeed educationally? Mr. Lacey. Well, I mean, if you're just gonna say that I'm lying to you and that we do not have in-school suspension when I know we do have in-school suspension, I mean, what does it matter what I say to you if you're going to tell me that I'm not really telling you the truth? Well, all I can say to you is... I mean, I know children that have been okay. in... in all school. I can say to you is we had a series of meetings with the school board staff, and when, I, when we asked them, and there were several of us there who said how many in-school suspensions, they said, we don't do in-school suspensions. And then when you go to the state website and you pull down the data on the state website, which we did, and you have how many in-school suspension, they reported zero. So I don't know what they're calling in-school suspension, but maybe there's the informal term they're using for in-school suspension, but they're not reporting it to the state as in-school suspension. Okay, and we also have, and, and what do you call restorative justice? If we have that in two of our schools, are you going to say we don't have that? Uh, the question is, do you support high stakes testing? Do I think that the question, do, 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 do I think that, do you that support I, eliminating high stakes testing? The system of testing under the, the performance index scores I think it could be improved. I, I agree that it should not be so high stakes. And I think that that is a state law that, that basically we just have to deal with. And, but I agree that, yeah, as it said, high stakes testing, to the degree that it is such high stakes, yeah, I, I think it, it does need to be improved. And, um, it could be revamped, and I mean, basically, the grading system is is not fair to urban districts. Thank you, Ms. Roundtree. 
I think as long as there is an educational system run by the state, and that's our form of government, that the state owns education, we're going to have some form of testing. Whether it's high stakes or not, I don't know. I think we have to look at the legislature, because they're the individuals that have the most influence on, on how and when and where students are tested. So I think that it does need to be revisited. It's new, and it's something that we just have to to kind of to, to disaggregate. We have to study that test, and we have to have a better understanding of it. When a district has 24 performance indexes and only receives two passing scores, we need to find out why. I mean, that, that intrigues me. Why? What is the problem? You know, we just can't take for granted that we have a, a, a school district that can only, only achieve two out of 24. But it's a complex issue. But it doesn't start with the district. It starts at the state level. So we have to be investigators and, and, and go to the legislators and, and ask them to help us better understand that, that test and the index. You can't win that what you don't know. I'm not going to play any game if I don't know the rules. So we have got to have a better understanding of that test, whether we like it or not, until it changes. We can't ask them to revamp it until we understand it. So we've got to understand that test to make recommendations to the legislators on how to change. And in the meantime, we've got to do a better job in preparing our children to pass the test. Some schools do Saturday boot camps. Why aren't all schools doing Saturday boot camps? If the test is here to stay or even for a little while, let's do a better job in preparing our children to pass that test. I do not support it, but we all know who's benefiting from it. Lobbyists are going to Washington, they're going up to the State House and saying, let's find out how many prisons we got to build. It's a corporation. Those numbers about those kids don't mean a thing to none of us. Kids don't benefit from it, the school district don't benefit from it. Just those corporations. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a dead issue because there's nothing to do about it. There is something to do about it. But our community don't have to get off their behind. Come on. They go out to step up, stand up, and speak. I don't care if you belong to one organization that's bougie or whatever. We got to come together with a common goal and speak up. And as long as you're sitting around quiet in the corner and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it, nothing's going to be done. Thank you. Thank you. As a result of test-based accountability regimes such as the No Child Left Behind Act, schools have incentives now to push out low-performing students to boost overall test scores. And I'm in no way saying Dayton is doing that. I don't know. That's something we have to look at. But there have been studies in other places that showed that students who were low performing got needed out longer sent, uh, disciplinary actions than students who were not, uh, than the high performing students for similar offenses. Okay? Uh, this punishment gap grew uh, substantially over the time when the test were being administered, at least in one study. So it'd be interesting for us to do a study in Dayton to see if that kind of punishment gap is being used within the city of Dayton. Black students are disproportionately represented at every stage of the school to prison pipeline. African American students are far more likely than their white peers to be suspended, expelled, or arrested for the same kind of conduct at school. In 2012, African American youth made up 64% of Dayton public school population. However, they accounted for 80% of out of school suspensions. There is no evidence that blacks misbehave to a greater degree than white students. They are, however, punished more severely, often for behaviors that are less serious. Minority students with disabilities are particularly vulnerable since many schools regard jail as a difficult, as, as a default for special education placement for poor minority children. 
African American students with disabilities are three times more than likely to receive a short term suspension than their white counterparts and are more than four times as likely to end up in correctional facilities. The question is, in recent years, statistics have indicated a substantial racial disparity in disciplinary actions towards minority students, particularly black students. What is your explanation of these statistics and what do you believe the solution uh, to remedy this issue is? Joe Lacey. And those are, are those national statistics? The statistics I read was uh, particularly for Dayton Public Schools in 2012. That, and the statistics are? Uh, African American youth made up 64% of Dayton Public School population, but uh, accounted for over 80% of the out of school suspensions. Okay. Yeah. And, the, and your question is do you, say, do you feel that? So uh, the question is, uh, in recent years, the statistics have indicated a substantial racial disparity in disciplinary actions towards minority students and particularly black students. Uh, so what is your explanation for these statistics and what do you believe the solution is to remedy the issue? Well, I mean, as I've said before, I think restorative justice as a system is the best solution. Um, do I feel that within a system that um, that has as many African American administrators as the Dayton Public Schools has, and the many the is the number of um, African American staff. I don't think I don't think it, it, there is this systemic um, racial discrimination in Dayton Public Schools. Mr. Hickman. I'm not familiar, familiar with these statistics, but bottom line, it's going to have to start at home in the community. You can't start anywhere else. And then you got to think about the X factor. It hasn't been in our schools for a while. I'm pretty sure most of you know what that is. We got to do better. This lady over here didn't. Got to know this man over here. This lady sitting back here with the glass, and she got to know the lady back there. In the pink star. Get to know each other. Get to know each other's kids. Talk to the kids. That's one thing I don't see. I don't see you talking to these kids. You walk past them like they weren't there. And when you talk to these kids, they want to know why. Take time to talk to them. You don't have to be a parent. You see the kids walking down the middle of the street, what do you do? Drive by, or do you stop and say, could you get out of the street before you get hurt? And majority of them get out of the street. So this is the community's job, nobody else's. Thank you. When I think about some of the issues that are going on in the public schools, I understand that it's very complex. I was with the superintendent this past Saturday and uh, President Joe Lacey at a retreat addressing these very same issues. And one of the factors that the superintendent mentioned was that the schools in West Dayton perform significantly lower than the schools in East Dayton. And you want to say, and you, and you ask yourself, why is that? Well, someone is assigning the least experienced teachers in West Dayton. We know that some of that has to do with the experience of the educators. We know that if it's a young, inexperienced teacher and a male, uh, African-American male uh, is, 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 is considered aggressive or threatening, they, they're going to be sent to the principal's office. For a more experienced teacher, someone's been teaching like myself for 30 years, I'm going to say, hold it, hold it, hold it. So we have to make sure that our teachers are culturally competent, that they know how to deal with the population that they're assigned. It goes back to training. That's, that's the bottom line for me. We can't work on the assumption that teachers are prepared to deal with the students that they're assigned. 
we have to start with square one. There should be an orientation on the first day of school at every single school, every single year. And the orientation ought to start being able to set the standards, the standards of expectations, and the standards of conduct, both inside the classroom, in the cafeteria, in the hallways. I've been in schools where you can walk down the hallway and hear a pin drop. And I've been in cafeterias where the principal screamed and hollered for 20 minutes. I wanted to get up and tell the kids to be quiet. Children will behave if you train them to behave. So it comes from top down. The administrators and the teachers must receive the, the proper training in order to deal with the students that they have to serve. Thank you. We appreciate all of the, the comments that you've given and the questions that you've answered and we're coming to the end of our program and we said that each person would be given two minutes to kind of give a closing comment. Uh, and Mr. Hickman, we're gonna start with you. I'd like to thank everyone for this opportunity today, especially this organization. But I'd like to instill in everyone that the board cannot do their job if no one comes to the meetings, if no one shows any interest. We have to, what we do is reflect the interest of the community, what the community wants. You don't come, that means you don't want anything and everything is kosher. You show up and voice your opinion, and then we gotta get busy. Well, I ain't got there yet, but still, the board's gotta get busy. So until our community consciously understands the importance of being involved in the education of these children, and I'm talking about church, I'm talking about neighborhoods, neighborhood organizations, fraternities, everyone, It will be a long time before this gets done. So we need your help. Thank you. I've been on the board eight years now, and I'm currently the board president. And so, <coughs> as I said, my daughter's in kindergarten, and this district does mean quite a bit to me. And if there are, are some perceptions perceptions that I think that, are, that aren't particularly accurate, um, then maybe this district does need to work on those perceptions um, and so that we can go forward as a community. Thank you. I am ready to serve this community. I'm ready to make our district better. I am unwilling to accept an F on a report card when it comes to education. I grew up right here in inner West Haven, in the hood, where people had low expectations and didn't think that anyone from this neighborhood could ever amount to anything. But I proved them wrong. I went to Sinclair Community College and walked most days to get there. I went to Central State and earned a bachelor's degree. I went to the University of Dayton and earned a master's degree in education. And then I went back and earned a law degree. I want to set an example for the young people in our community so they know that they can do it. But it takes hard work, it took a community, it took neighbors caring, it took teachers caring, it took hard work. We have to have high standards. I will never be associated with a losing district. I will not accept an F on a report card. I will find out what it takes to get that F to a better grade because we're a better community and it's not gonna happen by screaming and howling and being upset. We have to have deep analysis of the issue and figure out what we did right. We have an A school. Stiver's got an A. We have a B school. Decker got a B. Why don't we sit down and figure out what are they doing right and, and emulate that in some of the other schools? But it will take all of us. It will take volunteers to come out on Saturday to help them with their boot camps. If that's what it takes to get these kids to pass the, the test, then it means that they don't have money to hire people. So some of you all have to volunteer like we do. I'm not on the board. But the thing that I do right now is train tutors for the board. So come October the 19th at the YWCA, come pick up one of my cards, I'll be happy to give it to you. We offer free tutoring to community members to go into the Dayton Public Schools and to be a volunteer tutor to help children learn to read. You don't have to have a college degree, you don't have to have a high school degree. 
All you have to have is compassion. Thank you. Let's give, let's give everybody a turn I want to thank all of you all for turning out. I think this has been a valuable uh, uh, this, uh, uh, time. Um, I want to remind people to please complete the contact cards and turn them back in. Um, I, want, I would be remiss, I'm sorry, I'm a teacher and I teach race and racism in American law and I have my students in the audience. So I cannot, I have to deal with one of the things we deal with that when you deal with systems and structures that, that the race of the people running the system and structure doesn't change unless the system and structure change. And that so you can get black people running something and have systemic racism. Yes. You can get black people uh, administrating stuff because if all they do is continue the same system, that system may I'm not saying, have embedded racism. So those are things I teach my student and I couldn't let the comment pass without reinforcing the idea that uh, systems, uh, that the race of the person doesn't affect the, the whether or not systemic racism is there. Um, I want to thank the many organizations that have been leaders in this community for a very, very long time on the issues of mass incarceration, on the issues of violence in our community. Uh, obviously, the Adams Project that has been at the forefront of this, uh, uh, this, uh, these problems. Uh, the Black Men's Think Tank. I want to thank the students from my Race and Racism in the Law class and the Black Law students who came out to help us today. Um, I want to thank the Dakota Center, and I especially want to thank the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam has, uh, has sat at the table with us from the beginning that we start organizing them, and every single meeting they had someone there helping us, and so uh, a special thank to the Nation of Islam and to Wesley Center. Uh, as well. I went to the mayor and the commissioners are going to be tomorrow night at the Wesley Center. Uh, I really encourage you to turn out and it'll be the same format and hopefully as informative. We have a little snack out in the hallway. You can talk with the candidates uh, and meet them. Uh, thank you everybody. <laughs>